Amen. Thank you, Mrs. Green, for that tonight. If your Bible's open to John chapter 17, John chapter 17, if your Bible's tonight, I'm sure glad you're here in church at First Baptist Church. I am sure thankful for the uh, the men and ladies who work on our tech team here at First Baptist Church and enable us to have the live stream. But I am sure glad to be at church among my friends and fellowship, just like the Bible instructs us to be. I'm often, and if not always, encouraged when I come to church. My soul is lifted. And I'm lifted because I get to worship God with other like-minded believers. And I love singing with you as a congregation and love to add my voice to your voice as we lift our voices to up to him. And I'm so thankful to be here and appreciate all the encouragement that you bring. You know, sometimes when you come to church, the most important thing you're going to do is not listen to me preach. I'm going to do my best to bring you a message from God's word, but sometimes God has you here at church so that you encourage and influence someone else here. The Bible talks about a church being a living, breathing body. All right, and we all have a part in that. And each part is important, the individual parts, but the, the service is important as well, and the preaching and, the, and the, the worship. But God has something for us tonight, like he always does when we come to church. And I'm sure glad you're here tonight, John chapter 17. As you look tonight at three statements about knowing God, this morning we looked at what it means to know God, that God, if we seek him, will always be found. God is not very far, the Bible says. If you search for him, in Proverbs chapter 2, you're supposed to search for him as for a hid treasure. Search for wisdom. But he says in Jeremiah that if you seek him, if you seek me, you will find me. God says, I'll be found of you if, you if you look for me. Tonight I want to give us three statements about knowing God. John chapter 17, Jesus is speaking, beginning in verse number 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. We have some, I believe, some uh, uh, neat and exciting activities and, and events coming up at First Baptist Church. I believe that our mission here is to further the kingdom of God or to make him known that everyone who doesn't know Jesus, we want to know Jesus. And this week we have outdoor night, Thursday night. We're looking to make an event where people who don't know Jesus can be introduced to Jesus Christ. And maybe they'll come because they want to hear an excellent hunter give some good hunting tips. They'll also share the gospel. No secret. I'm not trying to trick anybody. We're seeking to make him known. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. Looking forward to Resurrection Sunday, to Easter Sunday here at First Baptist Church. Last year, we were able to be on television uh, during or on Easter Sunday. And this year, again, we have, uh, we have bought three time slots or three, three stations on Easter Sunday at 11 o'clock on Easter Sunday in this area on three different stations at 11 o'clock. If you turn on your television, you'll find the First Baptist Church. Last year, I couldn't get 11 o'clock, but a little, little planning ahead. Last year, the idea came to us. I think Pastor Scott said about three weeks out, hey, what if we got on TV? And I said, I never thought about that. I said, find out. And they found out you do, but you have like 35 minutes to be done with the program, like to record it and submit it. Not quite that short, but it felt that short. And boy, the Lord helped us last year and used it greatly. We had some testimonies we shared last year, folks, who had trusted Jesus Christ because of that broadcast. Praise the Lord. And then last year I said, well, what can we do this year? Let's try to lock it up at 11 o'clock. So if they, turn on, if they turn on their TV, Lord willing, they will hear the message from the Bible, which is that God loves them and Jesus died for them. That's the message. And we're excited about that. We're excited about our soul winning conference in April where we have a renewed focus on reaching the lost in this community for Jesus Christ. There are a lot of lost people in the world. Around the world, there are people who are dying and on their way to hell. Around the world, there are a lot of lost people. Is there not? In the United States, there's a lot of lost people who are dying and on their way to hell. Is there not? In Michigan, there's a lot of lost people who are dying and on their way to hell. Is there not? In Saginaw, Michigan, in Bridgeport, 
Bertrand, Frankenmuth, Clio, Burt, Saginaw Township, Midland, Bay City. All areas that are within a half hour of this place right here, there are a lot of lost people who are dying and on their way to hell. And our obligation, our command from Scripture is to let them know about Jesus Christ. And if we're not doing that, then we are missing the point of the gospel. It was never just for me to experience and to hold on to, but for me to experience, to grow, and to share. I want to tonight speak about knowing God, three statements about knowing God. What you look for, you will typically find. If you look to complain, you will find reasons to complain. If you look to be positive, you'll normally find ways to be positive. If you look to be kind, you'll normally find opportunities to be kind. If you look to see God work, you'll see him work. If you look to see him disappoint, then you'll most likely see him in your viewpoint disappoint. We have to know God not as we wish he was, but as he actually is. But how do we know if we know God? How do we know? Well, what are some markers? Well, what are some things that we know? And tonight, I want to look at three statements about knowing God. I wonder if you're like the one man who was asked, do you or how much do you know about God? And this man was honest, and he said, in reality, I know very little about God. And the fact is that is a very true statement. Even if we were to study our whole life, at the end of the day, in comparison to who God is, we would know just very little about him in comparison to who he is. But he said, I know very little about God, but what I know has radically changed me forever. To know God, to seek him, not as I wish he was, but as he actually is. They might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you would help us in this service. Lord, that you would touch us. Lord, that you would meet with us, that you would convict us in areas Lord, that we've not been responsive to you like we're supposed to be. You're such a gracious God. You're so merciful, full of compassion. Lord, we need you. We come tonight humbly, Lord. I come humbly asking for your help in this service. Lord, I ask for you to help me as I speak. Lord, help us as we listen. Lord, remove the distractions from this place. There are so many things that would seek to, to distract us, Lord, from the sound, the lights, the cell phones, all those things, Lord, that would seek to snatch away the truth from your word. Lord, I pray that tonight you would be evident in this service. Lord, we've come tonight expecting you to do something to work. Lord, please, please, would you do something? We'll give you the honor and the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. I want to give us three statements about knowing God that I hope will be a help and a challenge to you tonight. See, as Christians, we're supposed to know God. People who are not Christians, when they find out you go to church, they expect you to know something about God. It's encouraged a few weeks back in the men's prayer meeting that, that a man here had been praying for some co-workers and he prayed and asked because they knew he was a Christian and they came and asked him some things about God. Because you come to church, people expect you to have some idea. Because I'm a pastor, they expect me to, to, to know something about God, and I would hope that I do. But what is our focus in life? Where do we find ourselves spending our time day in and day out? There are those who have been saved just a little bit amount of time. I see Devin here tonight. He got saved. He got saved Friday night. What a blessing that was. The second time he was in church was this morning. This is the third time he's ever been in a church. And I'm glad that God touched his heart and he saw the light of the gospel and he trusted Jesus Christ as a savior. That's the best decision he will ever make, any of us could ever make. And I hope that a year from now that Brother Devin will know more of God than he does tonight. But there are those who have been saved for years yet seem at times to be stunted in their spiritual knowledge and spiritual growth. Content for the the smallness of God in their life. 
content with just coming to church when the doors are open and, and faithful in that, but missing the broader expanse of knowing God for who he is and what he is. Content to just check a few boxes along the way and think that God will be happy because I showed up to church. Now listen, you ought to be in church. You ought to be in church. I heard someone once say that you don't have to go home if you're married. But if you want to have a happy home, you better go home. Not bad advice. Not bad counsel. There are those who are who are content with a small idea of God. They're content to fit God into a, a little self-help category. Unfortunately, there is a whole movement where God is just good psychology. Self-help gospel. Let me just give you a little plug for the day and a plug for the week. Now, the Bible is intensely practical. As I strive to study his word and bring sermons that are true to God's word, I also try to bring sermons that are practical, that'll touch you tomorrow and Tuesday. I want to give you something when you walk out, an, an action that God wants from you and from me. The Bible is practical. We see that throughout God's word. It's practical. It says things like, husbands, love your wives. You know what that means? Husbands, love your wives. It says things like, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. You know what that means, children? Obey your parents. Intensely practical. Intensely practical. But the Bible's not just, and God is not just some self-help, pop psychology guru. Though if you do what he says, it works. Knowing God is so much more than that. I want to tonight give us three statements about this. The first statement is this. Knowing God is different than knowing about God. Knowing God is different than knowing about God. When Jesus in John 17 verse 3, when he says that they might know thee, the only true God, he was not implying just that you know about God. We can know about a lot of things and not know what it is. We think we know God because we hear about him all of the time. And we think we know God because we can describe him. Knowing about God and knowing God are two fundamentally different ideas. I don't want to know about God. I want to know God. In the process of knowing God... I will learn about him. But my goal, my aim, my mission, my idea is not just to learn more about him, it's to learn him. I mentioned this morning about how I met my wife for a blind date. How we had avoided the, uh, the situation, but as the Lord would have it, we were forced, forced to meet. Forced to meet. Both of us in the vehicle that day said, I didn't want to meet you. She said, I didn't want to meet you. Followed with her, said, she said, I'm moving back to New Jersey. Well, I went out to New Jersey that summer. I mentioned that briefly this morning. In New Jersey, I asked her to come back to Michigan. We weren't even really dating at that point. She told me later on that up until that point, she had said to herself, I am not going back to Michigan. He's a nice guy. She didn't know me yet. <laughs> He's a nice guy, and he's a Christian, but I'm here in New Jersey. I think the Lord wants me here. I'm not going back. And so apparently she was saying to herself, Doreen, be strong. Doreen, be strong. When I said, honey, or I said, Doreen, would you come back to Michigan? I'd like to see where this thing goes. She goes, okay, I'll come back. And then she said to herself, you're weak, you're weak, you're weak. Did I get that right, honey? One could say it's a Puerto Rican charm. One could say that. Or one could say it's a hand of God. I choose the latter. I know a lot about my wife. She knows a lot about me. She still likes me. You'll hear her cheer sometimes, and uh, if you've been to any games, you'll hear her cheer for the boys. She cheers that way if I'm playing a sport or running a race. 
She knows that in some things I'm kind of quirky. Don't ask her. Right? That's our business, right? You're like, oh, what is it now, Pastor? What are things? We all have those things, don't we? Like you want them just a certain way in life. Just the way it's supposed to be. One of those things was Christmas music before Thanksgiving. Boy, I could go on a whole rampage about that. I'm sure founded in the Word of God, no doubt. Clearly found in the book of opinions, the second chapter and the third verse. Thou shalt not play thy Christmas music until the day is that Thanksgiving is over. <laughs> Clearly, book of opinions. Maybe verse 4, not verse 3 in the book of opinions, chapter 2. Oh, and she would, it was a, a, not a point of dissension in our house, not a point of irritation, but we definitely did not see eye to eye on this Christmas music thing. She was definitely not happy when I moved on that point last year. Not happy, not because she could play Christmas music, but, but the reason why. And my daughter asked me to move and asked if she could play it after the second snowfall. I remember that night when, when Danielle asked, Daddy, could we play Christmas music after the second snowfall? My wife would describe that night. She was, I was sitting in the front seat, she said, and I was thinking to myself, oh, honey, thinking of Danielle, you're about to get your little heart broken. I've asked for years. Daddy won't say yes. And then she said she was shocked when I said, oh, sure, honey, if I can full snowfall, that'll be fine. Quirky. We all have little quirks, don't we? You know that God is unique? God's not quirky, but God's unique. When you begin to know him, it's different than knowing about him. You begin to learn what makes him happy, what grieves his heart, what makes him pleased, what makes him stop and ponder. In the New Testament, three times, Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus marveled. And we know what he marveled at? He marveled at someone's exercising of faith. You take note of that. When you learn who God is and about, and not just about God, but who he is, you learn what makes him tick and what makes him operate. Don't mistake knowing about God for knowing God. I find in the book of James a compelling verse where the Bible says uh, through the writer James, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. Don't know less of God than the devils do. In the New Testament, when the devils interacted with Jesus, there was fear. There was trembling. There was humility. There was pleading. And there was obedience. You know that not a single devil withstood the power of Jesus Christ? They can't. He is God. They had no choice but to obey. And sometimes, if I can, with all humility and honesty, we're not even better than a devil. I believe God. Well, that's great. You just hit the level. The devils. They know who God is. They see him at work. Now, they, they rejected him. And they're deceivers, or the devil uh, is a deceiver, but, but they know who he is. Knowing God is fundamentally, diff fundamentally different than knowing about God. You see, maybe you've heard of one of my best friends. His name is Thomas. I think you, most of you probably know, know Thomas. He's a junior. I'm the fourth, so we have something in common. He was born in 1977 and has blue eyes. I was born in 1980 and have brown eyes. We're practically twins. I know Thomas so well that I know how much he weighs, 225 pounds. And he's six foot four. Some call him Tom. I call him Tommy. I was real proud of my very best friend who I know so well because he just won that uh, Super Bowl last week. He's known by most as Tom Brady, but again, I call him Tommy. My friends, I don't know Tom Brady. I know about Tom Brady. I've seen him at work. 
I've even dare say I've cheered for him along the way. I've watched him for a lot of years play football and do his thing. But I don't know Tom Brady, do I? I just know about him. Don't mistake knowing about God for knowing God. But I've cheered for God along the way. I've been to some of the Lord's games. I know all about him. Different than knowing him. There's two things I want to bring to us, two ideas if we know God. Jesus said this. He said in John chapter 10, verse 4, And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. If I know God, I will listen for his voice in my life. How does he speak? He speaks a few ways. He speaks through his word. As I read his word, he speaks to me. He speaks through the spirit of God which lives inside of me. The Holy Spirit directs me into all and guides me into all truth. There are those times that, that the Lord has impressed upon me certain things. He speaks through the worship of him. When you're in church, you can, if you're one of his, you can often hear the voice of God in your life. There are times that maybe we have what we call conviction. We'll go to camp with the young people. We'll go again this summer. At camp, we try to get away from the things that distract us. We leave the cell phones back here. From the things that distract us, we leave the cell phones back here. From the things that distract us, we leave the cell phones back here. You know what we could do sometimes at church? We could leave the cell phones in the car. That wasn't in my notes, but I just may stop there for a second. For the things that distract us. Boy, how many times does the Holy Spirit want to work? And it's happened here at First Baptist Church. And all of a sudden, a cell phone rings. Listen, if you do bring it, do me a favor, silence it. Silence it, because you, you may distract someone else. I remember I was sitting right there the one day in the service, Pastor Lett was preaching, and someone called on that old, uh, that old Nextel direct radio. You know, beep, beep, hello. Right there, right about where, where Dr. Flanders is sitting, about right there. The lady answers back, and my wife was with me, answers back on the thing. I'm at church. I think the next thing she asked was, when do you get out? Pastor's still preaching. I'm there. I'm not listening to a word. I don't remember what he said that day. You're lucky I remember he was preaching, but I remember that conversation. Around noon. Beep, beep. Okay, beep, beep. Distractions. Distractions that seek to snatch away the voice of God in my life. You could leave your cell phone in the car. It wouldn't hurt you. If you can't leave in the car, maybe you're addicted to it. Oh, Pastor, Lester, don't be silly. Get back to the passage, please. I'm just getting warmed up. Put that thing down. Put it down and let God speak to you. You're sitting in church. We sit in a camp where we've left the distractions back with the cell phones. And the service, we have what we call invitation. I've been to many camps for our young people with our young people. I've seen God work in miraculous ways uh, throughout many different camps. I've noticed something. We come to invitation time at camp. When the Lord begins to work, people react differently. I've seen the, the teenagers who have been under conviction from the Holy Spirit and they are gripping the seat in front of them. If they could, they'd rip it apart. The struggle is that real. For some, you can see it on their face, the turmoil. For some, you see them when they respond and you see the freedom that God brings. Maybe you have felt the conviction of God in your life before. I've asked that question to the young people. What does the conviction of God feel like? And they'll give, well, you know, sweaty hands and oh, this knot in my stomach. Those are, could all be little things, I'm not saying. But, but there, is one, there is one similar element that when God speaks, you don't confuse it with something else. And all those services, and someone was under, under conviction, they don't say, well, it could be because I had camp food earlier. It's not why they have a knot in their stomach. They know it's the voice of God speaking to them. My sheep know my voice. When I know God, I know his voice. 
I know what he sounds like in my life. Jesus says this, that, that if I know God, I'll follow what he says. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Obedience to God brings further revealing from God. You want to know God? One way is to follow what he says. It's simple. It's simple. But so much easier said than done. Following what he says. To know God, not just about God. There was a giant ship who had a failed engine. The owners, the ship owners, and all the workers on the ship tried, and expert after expert tried, but they could not fix the engine until an old man who had been fixing ships from the time he was just a boy carried a large bag of tools onto the ship. He went down to the engine, as the story goes, and immediately went, immediately went to work. He carefully looked over the engine from top to bottom, and watching the owners watching this man eventually took out a hammer. Knocked the engine twice, and immediately, engine roared back to life. A week later, the, the bill came. The bill was for $10,000. The owners were shocked. They sent back a note, and, and they said, we can't pay this. You hardly did anything. Please send us an itemized bill. And the man sent back a bill that read this, tapping with a hammer, $2.00. Knowing where to tap, $9,998. This man didn't just know about engines. He knew the engine. Knowing God is different than knowing about God. But the second statement is this. Knowing God is beneficial for all of life. If you would, turn over to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Where Peter gives us a profound truth as he speaks of Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse number 3, the Bible says, According as his, that Jesus Christ, as his divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain to life, unto life and godliness. Pause there real quick. Everything that we need, life and godliness... Life in that verse refers to how to live the day-to-day. -day. You want to know how to be a good employee? That's life, according to this verse. You want to be a good husband, a good wife, a good son, a good daughter. You want to be a, a, a good citizen in the United States. Everything that pertains unto life that is involved in that word life and how we live. He has given us all things that pertain unto life. Everything we need to know how to live is found right there in that life and godliness. That's the spiritual side of things. Every idea about godliness is found through these next key words. All things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him have called us to glory and virtue. You know what knowledge of Jesus Christ brings? All things for life and godliness. Everything we need in life, Jesus said, you will find when you know me. You see, knowing Jesus is the key for how to live now and how to live forever. Jesus is the key for living, authored by God, applied for all things, accessible by all men. You, growing up, they had this little thing called Keys for Kids. Published from Grand Rapids and some very helpful. I think Uncle Charlie uh, was the one, the radio host, who read that. And as a family, as children, we'd listen and then re read this little book, Keys for Kids. Some tremendous Bible truths along the way, very practical things for children. And parents, you ought to be giving Bible truths to your children. All right, you ought to help them in their spiritual walk. It's your obligation, your job. And these keys for kids, they'd give you things about how to obey and how to have joy and how to be happy and how to take a stand for Jesus Christ. And they call them keys for kids. And they knew that the keys for the kids was to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the key for living. You see, we think we know how to live when we have a good handle on the world around us. I know what's happening in the news, then I know how to live. No, you know how to live when you know about Jesus Christ. 
I know how to live if I find out the, the latest uh, report from my doctor or I gather all the information I can or, or have the right game plan for my retirement and my 401. No, no, no. Everything you need for, for life for life and for godliness is found through the knowledge of him who hath called us to glory and virtue, through knowing Jesus Christ. Knowing God is beneficial for all of your life. You want to have a good marriage? Know Jesus Christ. Know God. You want to, have, or you want to be a good employee at work? Then know God. All things that pertain unto life. You want to handle your money wisely and be a good steward? Then know God. All things that pertain to life and to godliness. And one more statement tonight, though. Knowing God is more about a journey than a destination. Second Peter, Peter says this in a few chapters later, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, knowing God is more about a journey than a destination. When you get saved, you're introduced to the Son of God and His saving work. But that is just the beginning, is it not? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Is He sweeter after 30 years? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is He sweeter after 60 years? You better believe it. Knowing God is more about a journey than a destination. And I wonder, my friend, if you would have this testimony, I could not help but think of one of the most profound testimonies in all of Scripture that I hope would be the testimony of your life and my life. I hope it would be the testimony of every person who's saved here tonight. I hope it's the testimony of every young man in this room. I hope it's the testimony of every young lady, of every dad, of every mom, of every grandparent, of every saint, whether they've been saved two days or whether they've been saved 2,000 days. I hope it's their testimony, and it's the testimony of Enoch. In Genesis chapter 5, a profound testimony with these five words, and Enoch walked with God. We could say it this way tonight. Enoch was on a journey to know God. Could grander words be written? We know nothing else about Enoch's life. We know the end of it, but nothing else. Don't know his occupation. Don't know if he was handy with his hands. We know that about other people. We know in the Bible there are some warriors, there are some poets and musicians, there are some uh, who have accomplished great things. Enoch, we don't know about that. We just know that he walked with God. And we know what God did. And he was not. God took him home. He walked with God. What masterful words, what challenging words, what grand words. What simple words, he walked with God. My friend, I want you to be known by those words. Walk with God. Knowing God is more about a journey than a destination. An old Model T was pulled off on the side of the road with his hood up. The young man was trying desperately to get it running as the story goes. He'd been working at it for a long time when a limousine pulled up. Chauffeur jumped out of the front of the limousine, opened up the back door, and a well-dressed man got out. He watched the fellow knocking around on the Model T, offered a suggestion for a minor adjust adjustment, and lo and behold, nothing else had worked. The young man tried it, and it worked. Now, the old man said, your car will run just fine. The young man was amazed at how this well-dressed man in a limousine would know so much about cars. And he said, sir, please tell me, how do you know exactly about these cars? He said, well, my name's Henry. Henry Ford. I made the car, so I know how it works. And tonight, I'm asking us to know God. He made this place. He made you and me. He knows how it works. 
Are you on a journey to know God? Dads, are you on a journey to know God? You may be on a journey to make sure your family is well supplied for. And I hope you supply for your family. The Bible talks about that. But that's not why you're here on earth just to provide for your family. You're here on earth to know God. Moms, you walk with God? Are you seeking to know God? I'm sure you take care of your children like you ought to. But you're not here on earth just to take care of your children. You're here on earth to know God, that they might know the, the only true God. Kids, grandparents, employees, employers, are you on a mission, on a journey to know God? It's not a destination. It's a journey. That they might know the the only true God. And Enoch walked with God. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray you'd convict us tonight and challenge us. Lord, I pray you'd touch us. We can be consumed with so many things, but Lord, we must be consumed with knowing you. I wonder tonight with your heads bowed and eyes closed if that's your testimony to know God. If that's your mission. If that's your goal. Or if you've been distracted by something else. There are good things that distract us. There are good things that pull us off the task of knowing God. My friend, I want that testimony that Enoch had. He walked with God. My friend, if you're here tonight, and God touched your heart, respond to him. Lord, bless this time of invitation. May we let you work in our heart. In Jesus' name.